Satish Manishinder sir has been is a very very reputed lawyer has worked on many high profile cases if you just look up on the internet you will know a lot of high profile cases he has been work working on okay right from 1993 bombay blast case uh, the black buck case okay or the recent sushant singh rajput case but there is a lot of uh, so we are going to ensure that today the discussion is on the legal aspects we are not going to go on issues that are before courts or uh, uh, you know because we cannot discuss all of that whatever is sub judice so we're going to focus on the practice of law the practical issues that criminal litigators face uh so welcome sir and we've got a uh, we've got quite a few people here that are excited some are law students and some of them are practicing lawyers in uh different courts across india uh from delhi tamil nadu bombay we have people from a variety of places so so i i've got some questions prepared but uh i i'm open to yours you know starting it from sharing a little background about your initial years and your journey as a criminal litigator and then we can move forward see i came into practice uh, because i passed in 1983 i happened to be a, a serious student only in the last 2 3 years of my life as a student till then i was a back bencher and uh, the other day there was a picture which was on the whatsapp who said that uh, atal ji atal bihari vajpay narsimha rao and uh, chandrashekar were in the rear row madam sonia gandhi was in the first row so the caption was that the back benchers ultimately succeeded in becoming the prime minister so similarly i was a back bencher all through my school uh, the last few ranks were for me Uh, somehow being a student leader and uh, leading all the agitations my principal called me one day and he said if you don't get serious and if you're going to be part of these morchas all the time i want to throw you out of the college and uh, in can in uh, south any bad behavior is called a rowdy so <laughs> he said i am going to throw you out because you, you tend to be a rowdy i then said sir okay i will improve myself and subsequently he gave me a room in the college itself which was meant for the staff members so i was successful enough in uh, spending 12 to 14 hours as a student in that room prepared myself got a rank from the university i got a mudco competition uh, award as one of the outstanding law students so thereafter i came to mumbai then bombay joined mr ramji thulani in 1983-84 subsequently i practiced with him for about 10 years those 10 years that i spent with him were the most fruitful i got to study all for all fields of law civil criminal constitutional corporate court law monetary law labor law and you name it because that office received people from all walks of life and anybody who came there was not refused any assistance so once that was done i started practicing in all these uh, those days there is plus smugglers in bombay so the coffee pots or laws used to be used to detain them so one of the most fertile grounds for lawyers that time was challenging the veracity of the coffee pots or detention orders which was akin to misa the same provisions or national security act so that went on for some time and sometime in 1991 my practice changed it came to hardcore crime you know we started appearing for all these gangsters in mumbai right from daud arun gauli chota rajan and all these guys so there was no gang which i had not represented so lot of people like you used to ask me 
that sir why don't you don't you get scared of these guys because they come and meet you they come and brief you don't they target you because you are working for the other gang i said they have an ethics they need lawyers all the time so they don't like lawyers they'll settle this within themselves but not in a courtroom so that continued for some time and uh, 1993 uh, not 93 92 was the first tada case that appeared in because those days uh, uh, there are a lot of terrorism in uh, punjab in 1986 sorry my first tada case was in 1986 that law was framed in 1984 and the first trial that i got to handle was in 1986 because the punjab terrorism was a big menace to the entire society apart from uh, north like punjab haryana delhi uh, some parts of up wherever the sikh population was there mumbai bhopal and all these places there used to be a lot of offenses being committed so they targeted they they they, they framed uh, the tada act terrorist and disruptive activities act to curb terrorism because those days they started using this ak47 rifles bombs hand grenades and you know uh, in uh, maharashtra they call it sutli bomb which is made out of uh, uh, some thread and then it is assembled that way so these kinds of uh, you know ammunitions and uh, bombs were being used so to contain that kind of terrorism they got this law which had a special provision number 1 was it had lot of provisions it had a special court to try all the offenses uh, there was no direct there was no uh, appeal to the high court appeal lay directly to the supreme court so they they cut off one uh, court of appeal then there were provisions where a statement made by a police officer of rank of dcp was made admissible uh, in order to uh, what they used to do was they used to record uh, confessions which were all tell tale there's all there's to correlate all the investigation papers get some uh, corroborative material and write it on their own and the magistrates who used to record those confession statements of the police officer used to oblige the police investigating officer so this became a rampant practice most of these cases were handled in punjab but one such case landed in maharashtra general vaidya who was uh, uh, in charge of the army he was the gen- chief of staff of the indian army during uh, the operation blue star in 1984 was targeted because they said the sikhs thought that if the golden temple has been uh, bombarded the army chief the northern commander or the western commander who was in charge of punjab then a lieutenant general and a major general they were all on their hit list general vaidya general uh, Su- Su- surendranath general brar so all these people they 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 are being provided the security but once general vaidya retired from the indian army he settled in pune So in 1984 to 1986, those days there were a lot of robberies in Bombay, bank robberies, dacoities. So five to six banks got looted from the period of January 1986 to April 1986. They used to loot the cash. They they used to in which uh, states, sir? The looting happened of the banks. Various other banks. I okay. can't name them now. No different states. I'm saying in Maharashtra itself. In Maharashtra. Bombay. Okay. Because there's a lot of cash in Bombay. There's a lot of cash in <laughs> Bombay those days. It's easier to get a lot of cash from one branch rather than going to several branches. Uh-huh. So what they used to do was they used to target the cash box which used to be delivered every morning by a secure van. After the box reached the bank, they used to go and loot the bank. They used to hold uh, hostages and you know. some in some cases the watchman was killed security guard was killed the cashier was killed who resisted 
so people were scared so what happened was when these terrorists so called terrorists they were coming from punjab to mumbai they committed an offense in rajasthan so the rajasthan police were after them so these boys from punjab they came and settled in mumbai in one place called antop hill in antop hill there are the central government staff quarters since they are not some of the best quarters the people who are out in these apartments used to be staying in private residences and giving these apartments on lease and make money and compensate for the rent they were paying it elsewhere or they had purchased a few flats so these people used to get uh, you know cheaper flats so they came and decided there they feigned as if they behaved as if they are college students subsequently a constable from rajasthan came tracing them and ultimately he zeroed in on an apartment so he told the local police station that he give me two guys i will go and get those guys so what happened was they made one constable wait far away local police station and the other constable said that before you actually go and raid it let me go and check whether they are really the same same ones then i'll give you a sign he went as a postman and found that three to four people were staying there so when he was making several inquiries those people in the apartment the boys sick boys who were mona like you and me they detained him tied him up took all the cash and ran away so after some time those the second constable would come from the san hall san police station he came with the police party to raid when he got the message but they found that their own constable was arrested uh, was detained in the apartment tied up you know with fastened with the, some the ropes and all that so when they took the search of the entire apartment the commissioner of police everybody was down there in the building there was a novel on the back of the novel was a story uh, was a car number mfa 4173 or something so the police tried to test that car because there was a name written on that uh, uh, novel that this is banumati vaidya so they thought that you know this is banumati vaidya they forgot about it. they did not trace who that banumati vaidya was had they gone to check out the owner of the vehicle they did realize that is the general vaidya's wife in pune it was the pune registration so these boys ran away from there went to pune on i think 16th of august or 8th of august and shot dead general vaidya so that became the first tada case in maharashtra i was appearing in that case and because these people were dreaded even the magistrate used to conduct the proceedings of remand and others on the road because if there is a holiday intervening these magistrates would not take them in their house they would say these are terrorists we can't and if they see my family members they will kill them so that was the kind of fear that these people were created in spite of that law and that had no provision for bail a charge sheet in the normal murder case is filed in 90 days whereas in that in that under the tada a period of 180 days was given so subsequently subsequently when uh, there was a lot of misuse of the tada that case actually was tried in the jail in pune because uh, nobody was willing to bring those boys to the court in spite of the security that was being provided there was always a scare that some of the sympathizers would come and free them so we used to go to a jail there was a large parade ground around the jail the court room was in the center of it the entire court room was surrounded by cops so that was the fear psychosis created because of this terrorism 
So to curb that, TADA was being enforced. Some of the salient features of TADA was that uh, if you apply for bail, like in the normal courts, the judge would hear it. And if the PP objected, the judge would also hear it. But whereas in that case, under the TADA, unless the public prosecutor gave no objection for grant of bail, or if he made a submission that while on bail, he is likely to commit another TADA offense or some other offense, bail was a, as a matter of fact rejected. So this law was being misused from time and again. And uh, though there was a conviction in that uh, General Vaidya states, both those boys who were part of the assassination were sentenced to death. The law was being used, not only in Maharashtra, but all over the country. There was a furor. And with the political change, the provisions of confession, provisions of bail, provisions of uh, uh, filing of a charge sheet on 180 days, they were all amended by a 1987 Act. In the 1987 Act, there was a provision which was brought in that if the punishment, the, that if the offense is punishable only for possession, then it had to be classified separately than a normal TADA offense under Section 5. Unless earlier the law was the burden of proof always shifted on the accused. Whereas in a normal case of trial under the Indian Penal Court, the burden is shifted on the prosecution. They had to prove a case beyond reasonable doubt. But in a TADA offense, the burden always shifts on the accused to disprove a case of the prosecution. Innocence is not presumed under the TADA. So these provisions were amended to make it in such a manner that a trial, uh, the, the, the charge sheet had to be filed within 80 days and after every 180 days, the state government, every six months, the state government had to set up an advisory board. And that advisory board would recommend which cases, in which cases, TADA should be dropped, in which cases it should be allowed to continue. That was one. Secondly, the provision of recording a confession before a magistrate or before a police officer, there was a goodbye to it. Though it continued, it said that must be super subscribed by a magistrate. So they started recording confession before a magistrate, where there was some semblance of a court proceeding, but not that it succeeded. You know, most of the magistrates are obliging. In, in, in view of the fact that the police use tremendous power in, in an area of the police station. Apart from all this, the special court used to try exclusively TADA cases. Slowly and steadily, these cases started increasing. There was a misuse, there was a misuse. Ultimately, Supreme Court started seeing some light in, in, those day, in those years and gave various judgments where provisions of bail, provisions of confession, provisions of filing of a charge sheet in time, the advisory board, etc., they were all a little relaxed. Judges started taking a humanitarian view and the fact that a lot of law was being misused. Then came the 1993 blast. Before 1993 blast, there was one more case I dealt with in Bombay, where Arun Gauri, the gangster, was arrested with the AK-47 rifle in Bombay. That was the first seizure of AK-47 in Maharashtra, where he had hidden it below the uh, harmonium. They had a safe cavity in the kitchen or somewhere. And there it was found. And he was tried for that offense as well as the murder. I represented him in both the cases. In, in one case, he was convicted. In the other case, he was acquitted because in one case, he had all police witnesses against him. In the murder case, there are not so many. So then came the 1993 blast. This was a horrendous incident which happened in Bombay. 
256 people were killed. There were thousands of people who were injured. There were said about 10 to 12 blasts over Bombay. The stock market was destroyed uh, in the sense that uh, the building had to be closed on for several months. The Air India building was uh, bombed. There were so many hotels which were bombed. The Centaur, for, um, uh, uh, Sea Rock and various other places. There was a huge blast in front of the passport office because every morning people would collect there for a collection of passports or you know submission of their documents. So there used to be very crowded and particularly Friday was a time when they used to there used to be a lot, lot of congregation. And unfortunately, all these people who, who committed the blast chose Friday for this incident. Because on the Friday, between 12.30 and 1.32, they would go for the namaz. At which time, a lot of Muslims will not be on the road in, in, in these places. So they planned it in such a way that their community was not heard. This blast was in retaliation to the demolition of the Babri Masjid. The Babri Masjid demolition left a very sad taste in the history of our country. It's a different factor now that Ram Tem Sri Ram Temple is being built there. But the cause of the Mumbai bomb blast was the destruction and demolition of the Babri Masjid. There the real terrorism started in the entire part of India because those days there were not so many bomb blasts other than Kashmir and Northeast. And the army was tackling them. But here, it started hurting the normal common man. So, what actually happened was by 93-94, they realized that Tata was an effective way to control terrorism and in these matters. So they prosecuted all the people, about 175 people, who were charge sheeted in uh, the bomb blast case, Sanjay Dutt and five others along with him were arrested for possession of a firearm. One AK-47 rifle was also alleged to have been used or possessed by him, but which was never found, except a spring of the AK-47. There was no recovery at all. Whereas the weapon, 9mm pistol, was recovered because the person who uh, allegedly was given the weapon for destruction, said that, sir, the weapon was so good, I didn't feel like destroying it. It was a, it was a beautiful weapon. Subsequently, Sanjay Dutt was tried. Uh, initially, what happened was that he was on bail, given by the High Court. Then, because of various factors, a lot of opposition to him and, you know, government took uh, the fight, the hilt, and the High Court same bench which had granted bail, cancelled the bail again. On the ground, that when we pointed out the judgments of the judge who had given bail in several other matters, he said, no, now I'm capable of changing my mind. That day I held this view. Today I'm holding this view. And he cancelled his bail. So at that time, I was handling Sanjay Dutt right from the first day till he got bail on the 5th of May 1993 on the first occasion. Subsequently, I was out of the matter because I set up my own practice. And in 1994, when he lost in the Supreme Court, the, the bail was rejected in the Supreme Court. Sanjayadat came to me and Sunil Dutt came to me and requested that I should take up the case. So at that on that occasion, I decided to take it up. And like I told you earlier, there was a provision in the Kartar Singh judgment and the one more judgment of the Supreme Court that the state and the center, if the prosecution was by the state, the state, and if the prosecution by the center through CBI or other organizations, the center had to prepare an advisory board. That advisory board had to sit and decide what they should do about the pending cases and whether any of those people who are in custody need to be released on bail. Because of the draconian provisions of law on grant of bail, the 
judges were not very amenable in granting bail. The law was very strict. So thereafter, because of the advisory board, Sanjay Dutt was recommended for grant of bail by the state authority, state advisory board. But the high court, by, by the designated court, did not accept it. He said he is being prosecuted by the CBI. So you will have to get it from the CBI. So we got no objection from the CBI for his release on bail. Along with Sanjay Dutt, 75 other people got that relief. So Sanjay Dutt getting bailed out helped about 75 people to be bailed out along with him. So this was a good cause for which we also fought and the government also helped during those days. And the trial went on for about donkey's years, for about 17 years, for 14 years. So thereafter, he was convicted. He was convicted only for possession of a firearm and not of any terrorist offenses. Tada was dropped against him, whereas other people got uh, convicted. There were about 29 pe people who were sentenced to death. Out of them, some of them went to Supreme Court, some of them were set aside, some of them were hanged. Uh, most of them uh, got uh, reprieve, they got life imprisonment, and th that's how Tada, after the Bomblas case, started getting much more easier and relaxed, and it died a natural death. When the Congress government came to power, they did not renew the, they did not promulgate a new law replacing it. Subsequent to Tada, the POTA came, Prevention of Terrorism Act. That was on the similar lines of TADA, but that also was allowed to lapse over a period of time. So now there is no TADA, there is no POTA, but if an offense has been committed in 1993 or 1994, 1984, when the TADA Act was prevalent, and those people who are accused of those offenses, those uh, there is a saving provision that those people who committed an offense during that act, though it is procedural, they can be tried under the same act. So even now, as recent as three years, Abu Salem was tried by the Tada court in Bombay. And uh, he was convicted of various offenses connected to the Tada case of the bomb blast. So that is what TADA is and that is how TADA was used and misused and that is how I experienced uh, defending all these dreaded people in um, the Sikh terrorism. I had appeared uh, in the north for, for various people. I can't name those people. I had appeared in uh, Hyderabad. I had appeared in UP. I had gone to other states. So they used to say that he's a terrorist expert. Unfortunately, I got tagged or a gangster's expert. So these, these nomenclatures which are attached to your name at times go away once that act comes to an end. But we continue to shift to other fields where human rights are violated. But I can tell you that uh, though it was a special act, though it was meant to try a case much faster, those trials never took place the way it was intended to. Very few of them, particularly in the north, got completed. In another feature of Tada and Pota was that the names of the witnesses had to be kept a secret so that they don't get attacked by the people who are accused. So in such cases, I'm sure a lot of mischief must have happened on the side of the prosecution by just getting people to depose the way they wanted to because their identity had to be screened, kept a secret. They wouldn't face the accused. So we didn't know who was deposing or if he came to depose, we did not know who this person was because we had no chance of conducting an investigation as to whether he's telling the truth or no. There are various ways of catching a bogus witness or a stock witness that the law normally calls them 
if he is in the stock of the police for panchnama and others and repeatedly appears as a punch, punch witness he is called as stock witness so that such people have deposed in courts in various courts even in the tada they must have come and deposed we couldn't catch them there was one drawback of that act apart from the bail and you know harsh conditions of confession quick trial which never happened fast track court like today now there are so many fast track courts i don't see any fast track it takes longer time than a fast track court in a normal court so these are some of the uh, draconian provisions of those kinds of acts which were specially used to curb terrorism and ultimately terrorism cannot be curbed by these draconian laws the thinking in our society the mindset of the society and uh, the prevailing circumstances political circumstances should be changed so with this i keep the house open for questions we have another 20 minutes for questions because i had to pack up for another meeting all right sir thank you so much i am going to invite the attendees to ask uh, some questions you can write your question on chat and i can take it up with sir so uh, i also had uh, one question which i'd like to ask uh, so uh, today apart from the regular criminal uh, ipc crpc evidence act combination you know, which you can say is the like bread and butter of a criminal lawyer what are the other criminal law statutes that one should look at specializing in or practicing it see uh, there are various kinds of laws which are now been framed to curb crime one of them is the negotiable instruments act where thousands and thousands of cases are pending that i that's more more like a quasi judicial proceeding quasi civil proceeding not a pure criminal proceeding but there are other special acts like the prevention of corruption act which curb corruption there are special courts that is the ndps act which deals particularly with drugs i just now appeared for shovik chakravarti who is the brother of riya chakravarti in the sushant singh murder case the sushant singh death case so in that uh, though the offenses were bailable a draconian provision has been brought under section 27a that if a person is accused of helping or harboring manufacture storage warehousing and other such allied activities the minimum punishment is 10 years maximum is 20 years so here again the law can be misused but it's a very specialized field of law once you get into that practice it's very easy to uh, you know handle your practice in the sense that in each district there are special courts for example narcotics is rampant in punjab or in delhi so it's a good field where people can specialize in it's a very technical law in the sense that every step has to be watched by the defense lawyer your duty is to pinpoint some lacuna in the investigations because many times seizure is made panchnama is made statements are made if it is recorded by the ncb if the police record them they don't record a confession but they'll get these stock witnesses so it's very easy to break into those apart from that unless it is derived as to what is the chemical composition of that particular drug most of these drugs are adulterated and no in every field wherever there is money involved mischief always takes place adulteration always takes place cheating always takes place so you should concentrate on these kinds of laws in particular the cfsl chemical analysis chemical analysis report and all these factors another fertile field now is the prevention of money laundering act because wherever there is criminal breach of trust forgery of documents banking transactions or prevention of corruption act involved they are the scheduled offenses if any one of them is committed straight away it is referred to the pmla court 
and the investigation takes place at the hands of ED. ED has special powers. They can record statements of accused which are admissible. They can be used against you. Similarly, there are other draconian provisions of admissibility, attachment of property, and all sorts of things. Then you have the Food Adulteration Act. Because every day, you will find rights from weights and measures, quality of the food, quality of the product, soaps, oils, shampoos. You know, in all this, there's a lot of adulteration. Many of them don't meet the required chemical uh, composition which has been printed on the seal of that bottle. So therefore, these are some of the special acts. There are others. I don't know if uh, people practice matrimonial law. If you are practicing matrimonial law, you must also get into these domestic violence cases. Now there is a provision under the Domestic Violence Act. Because normally a divorce case takes a long time. You want to get shelter for the wife. Whereas under the Domestic Violence Act, there are shorter ways of getting relief to a lady. Similarly, if there is a dowry offense, you can invoke Dowry Prohibition Act and all this. So these are some of the special acts and uh, customs, GST. All these are, you know, special courts. Or if you are practicing uh, SEBI law, there are special courts to deal with SEBI offenses. So it's a very fertile ground now for people to grow and branch out. You don't have to go only to the High Court or the Supreme Court. There is more work in these trial courts. People, unless they have a grounding in trial courts, you can't practice in your High Court and in the Supreme Court. A lot of times, you know, I, I, I find a lot of students coming to me and telling me after internship with me for about six months or one year, that sir, now I won't be coming back to Mumbai. So where are you going? They'll say, I'm going to the Supreme Court. I said, you're going directly to the Supreme Court. You're not based in criminal law. You're not based in civil law. You're not based in constitutional law. You're just going to read the books and give some arguments to your senior who will go. That's how you learn. But unless you practice procedural laws, for example, if you are dealing with a civil appeal, CPC is there, Indian Evidence Act is there, Limitation Act is there, Stamp Act is there, various other you know provisions. Similarly, in a criminal trial, unless you master the Indian Evidence Act, the Criminal Procedure Court, and the Penal Court, and other allied laws, you will not be able to argue a criminal appeal for final hearing, like a murder case or a rape case where life sentence has been granted. You should have grounding of trial courts. It's very must. The Bar Council wanted to start a scheme where unless you practice for five years in the lower courts, you will not be allowed to practice in the constitutional courts. This is a must because people who are arguing various legal issues in connection with interpretation of Evidence Act, Criminal Procedure Code, or the Civil Procedure Code, or the Limitation Act, or other uh, such allied laws, they have no practical experience of having dealt with these cases. They don't know how a purchase is filed, or an injection application is filed, how interim applications are filed and disposed of, how documents are admitted in evidence. You know, these things come only through practice. Law doesn't come by reading books. You get mastery over law by practicing it yourself, by using that law in day to day practice, not by reading 10 volumes of uh, Supreme Court cases and getting the law mastered. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, there are a couple of, there are a lot of other questions. I'm going to pick and choose some of them. Uh, and I'll combine this one. There's one question on, is it possible to arrest a minister or MP for TADA? And also is a civil servant or a foreigner under POTA and TADA? See, there is no embargo from arresting anybody. I have seen several ministers, several bureaucrats, several politicians, 
being charged for offences under the TADA. If he has committed an offence, if he has, in fact, yeah. in Maharashtra, uh, in one uh, JJ shootout case, a senior politician who was a mayor of a, a corporation was arrested because his car was misused for ferrying people who were injured in a shootout in the JJ hospital case. The several ministers who were prosecuted. It's like, you know, prosecuting a person under the Prevention of Corruption Act, Lalu Prasad Yadav, who was the chief minister. Then you have the chief minister of Himachal Pradesh. The gentleman, I don't remember his Congress fellow. So, so there's no requirement of sanction and no immunity. Neither there's of no immunity for a politician or a minister. If you're committing an offense, which has no connection with your day-to-day uh, -day activities as a minister, or if it is not in the discharge of your official duties, Committing an offence under TADA, Correct. Prevention of Corruption Act, is not in the discharge of your official duties. There is a sanction required under the TADA, there is a sanction required under the POTA, but those offences are against the nation. Right. So, you know, if a sanction is required, it's not difficult. Because he can't take a defence that I was performing my office duty while committing a terrorist offence. Or he right. can't take an he can't take a sang he can't say that you need sanction to prosecute me for rape or murder. Right. Unless he has those exceptions of grave and sudden provocation or intoxication. Intoxication is not self-intoxicated. Not by drinking yourself sitting alone and you go and commit an offense. You take a, you can take an offense, you can take an exception to an offense on ground of intoxication. If somebody else has intoxicated you, adding to your drink, making you, you know, uh, immobile, or changing the course of your thinking, by somebody adding something to you, or not by your friend making you drink 10 drinks and then you can go and commit an offense. <laughs> That's a bogus defense. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, sir, one more question on. Uh, so, how does one handle the, the the labeling aspect of it? As you said, right? People said that you're a gangster's lawyer, and you said that later, of course, uh, the law itself, the the furor around the law, uh, weaned away. But how does one handle I two things? One is the ethical aspect, and second, the labeling aspect of this. If one chooses to practice, because a lot of times people shy away from this kind of practice because of these these issues. Also, then there is also the media saying things about what is happening about all the cases. So, how does one go about that? See, ethically, as long as you're not compromising your conscience, you're not compromising with the opposite side, as long as you're not committing any offense while performing your duties as a lawyer. Say, for example, you're allowing or you're advising a client to forge documents or you're advising him to destroy evidence or you're helping him to dispose of weapons of murder, then ethically you're wrong. Your mm. duty as a lawyer does not allow you to do all that. Right. But if you stick to your life, if you stick to your conscience, if you stick to your field of law, then nothing can change. Ethically you're wrong. There are very few reasons by which you can refuse to defend a person. Unless there's a conflict. Suppose now tomorrow somebody comes with a case to me and said, Sir, you take a case against Mr. Agarwal. I want to prosecute him. Now that I met you, you have become my friend. I have not known you earlier, but now today you are our friends. I, ethically, it is wrong on my part. Because if I know that you have done some acts while performing this uh, program or some other thing, and you are being prosecuted for that, I can't take a case against you. They're ethically wrong. Morally, I may be right. You know, that you are not retained me. Merely because you invited, for a, you invited me for a cup of tea or a talk, you are not morally uh, right. aligned with my professional duties. And uh, the backlash that you get. For example, when I appeared, for example, uh, when I uh, did 
जनरल वैद्यस केस और सिख टेरिस केस आई वॉज कॉल्ड एंटी नेशनल बिकॉज यूर डिफेंडिंग पीपल हु आर अक्यूज ऑफ कमिटिंग एंड ऑफेंस अगेंस्ट द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया Similarly, when I was doing the Sanjay Dutt's case, this is a terrorist lawyer. Hmm. You should not get branded because you are performing a particular act. Okay. Or, for example, today I am doing this Riya Chakravarti's case. If you go online, you see the number of trolling that happens in the name of Satish Maneshinde continuously. Hmm. It should not affect you. All that is meant deter you from performing your duties. You, mm. your duty as a lawyer is to carry out fearless duty before a court of law. As long mm. as you don't participate with her activities, along with not advising her to commit more offences or misuse the law, you are within your rights to defend a person. That's very very so useful, sir. There is so much of attack on TV. For example, one or two mm. channels want to know my fees. They want to discuss my fees. That that aspect is only between my client and me. Yes. How can anybody question me as to what fee I am charging, as to what uh, I am getting paid? They are not an income tax authority. The government of India can ask me to show my yes, record sir. at the end of the year when I file my tax returns. If I accept it. Cash payment or some illegal payment, government can always question me in between. But they can assess my account only at the end of the year. So therefore, we should do your duty to the best of your conscience and uh, truth. As long as you don't side with all these criminals in their activities, you are safe. Got it. So this was really really useful, sir. So Thank Sukirti uh, and a lot of others who was around the media trial, the mental pressure, the bias. I hope this answer was really useful. And anybody who yeah, thinks of getting into is concerned, yes, sir. as far as media trial is concerned, the Supreme Court in R K Anand's case has given guidelines about what lawyers should do who are appearing in a particular matter. You should not go and air your feelings. Respect of merits of a case, where you are appearing in a matter, you can go and comment upon the judgment delivered by a particular court, but you can't interfere when the case is being tried or when it is being heard. That would amount to contempt because you are trying to influence the course of justice. You are interfering with administration of justice. Similarly, you can't keep publishing things in respect of a witness. Or in fact, in respect of a party, these are all uh, not uh, allowed. They are prohibited. Got it, sir. Please, I conclude and uh, thank you, sir. Sir, there is one popular request that would you be willing on some other day to take a session on NDPS, PMLA, and Unlawful Activities Prevention Act? Yeah, that is. I need, uh, I'll need enough uh, enough notice. Yes, sir. We will. We, we will. Is, uh, ahead of time, sir. We will ask you. Do it, then we'll do it. Yes, sir. Definitely. You can be in touch with me, and we'll do it. Right? Yes, sir. Definitely. Thank you so much, sir. I could not take all the questions. I'm sorry, sir. I have to leave. Uh, but this was an extremely amazing discussion, and I look forward to having more. Uh, we will get in touch with sir and see when he's available, and so that we can come back to all of you with a session. I find time for all these. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.